welcome back. It's now time for Off the Press. Let's invite our guest, Mr. Chundi Kolawale, a public affairs analyst. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, my sister. How was the weekend? Fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's go yeah. straight to the Punch newspapers. Headline says, government 4.8 billion naira pledge. Federal government can't be trusted, says National Association of Resident Doctors. We negotiated with NMA, minister insists. Nard says, we can't go back to our members with empty promises. Pay first. Ngige tells doctors, we didn't hold talks with you. Your matter is in court. Above the headlines on the punch, Nigerians in diaspora remit $65.34 billion in three years. CBN says food imports gulped $1.04 billion in six months. Grays and reserves, autumn threatens legal action against Buhari. Bread price hike looms as bakers decry flour cost. Fuel price remains until federal government labor and negotiations, says PPPRA. Jehesu says Buhari's son's wedding, other large gatherings can fuel COVID-19 infections. Below the headlines on the Punch newspaper, we see pictures of former President Olusegun Obasanjo taking a knee um, before the Olu of Wari, and more pictures from that coronation ceremony. And it says, Atuwase the Third Ascension, new dawn for Ishekiri, that's according to Obasanjo. Catholic clerics should not endorse political leaders, Bishop warns. Wanted drug dealer arrested in Lagos Church, man excretes heroin. Vehicle conveying Delta wedding guest, some assaults, seven die. Ex-herbalist allegedly hypnotizes Lagos teenager. Victim recovers in Ondo State. COVID-19, Ogun lecturer tackles Lagos over the tension. Government threatens prose prosecution. Lastly on the Punch newspaper, Kaduna Baptist School of Doctors promised to release all abductees free 15. Now moving on to the Daily Sun newspapers. Big one you can see on your screen says, Grazing Roots, Autumn Blows Hot, Plans to Sue Buhari. Group drags president and others to court over failure to investigate missing 106 billion naira in 149 MDAs. Uh, we can also find, of course, once again, the picture of Abbasinger and the Ulu of Wari. 2023, Ohaneza insists parties must zone presidency to southeast. Plateau killings, Ipazu orders evacuation of Abia students. IPOB accuses security operatives of plot to disguise as ESN to enforce sit at home. And joy, tears as 15 abducted Baptist students regain freedom. Again, bandits slaughter 12 in Katsina community. Nine bodies recovered as gunmen killed three in reprisal attacks in Kaduna. Self defense, Masari defends uh, stance, dismisses call for resignation. Uh, and of course, uh, FAAN in 140 billion naira financial mess owes staff, pensioners, contractors. Those are the stories on the Daily Sun. Let's go to the Guardian newspaper. The headline reads, Autumn Ohanese fallen a kick over a known grazing roots. Benue governor threatens legal action against Buhari. Ranching, federal government should allocate 6.25 billion naira to other states. That's according to Falano. Yoruba groups analysts say federal government's move an invitation to war and anarchy. Farmers say federal government should procure land for all, not only herders. Why CBN's $50 billion intervention fails to rally confidence in stock market. Gunmen killed 12 persons in fresh Katina attack. 500 COVID-19 deaths recorded at Lagos Isolation Center. Why we oppose Obianos proposed 60 billion Naira supplementary budget by ZLP. Lastly on The Guardian, Gumi tells politicians that they're milking Nigerians. And now to the Daily Trust. PDP crisis. Anxiety as Secundus rejects October deadline. Aircraft handling. Federal government operators lose $28 million yearly. Taraba. Fulani leaders hand over 11 kidnappers and gun runners to police. Doctors in mass exodus amidst NARD strike. It says less than 40,000 doctors, 7,200 million Nigerians. Um, federal government should develop emergency intervention, says the NMA. We can also see here, bandits release 15 more students of Bethel Baptist. Plateau unrest, just Muslim communities to, protest, or to protect churches. 
And uh, Buhari's, uh, Buhari's son's wedding, Gumi blasts politicians who flew jets to Bichi. Good morning, Mr. Tunde Kolawale. Thanks for joining us once again. Good morning, my brother. All right. Um, we probably can start with the um, uh, story on the release of the Bethel, uh, 15 more Bethel Baptist uh, uh, school kids. Um, it's celebration for those parents, but it still says about 60 plus are still in captivity. Uh, quickly also, uh, react to that, please. Well, I want to rejoice with the parents of uh, the Baptist uh, school uh, students that have been released. I also rejoice with the state government. Uh, all parents uh, who are seeing this on the pages of the newspaper, this money will be glad to receive it. Thank God the guests are back home. But no one is still comfortable that children will be adopted within the confines of Nigeria and they will stay that long in the kidnappers uh, den. We aren't doing enough to safeguard the safety of our children and it is the future of the Nigerian nation that is at stake now. When children are scared, when they cannot go freely to school and have the peace of mind to do their studies and all that, how will we be able to produce the leaders uh, of uh, tomorrow? And uh, related to that story, there is also another one in there which says that uh, some other school children have equally been kidnapped. I think about um, uh, 12, 12 of them, or I mean, uh, about 12 of them somewhere else. So as the bandits are releasing some students, they are also kidnapping new ones. And the, why is it so? It is because we probably as a nation, we probably think that the security people are not doing enough. I have always said that there should be layers upon layers of security around students when they are in school. There are also technologies all over the world now to be able to locate some point where these children might be kept by the bandits when they are adopted. And there are all sorts of uh, tranquilizers, neutralizers like some grenades that can be thrown into the kidnappers then, and everybody goes in there to sleep, and then the security will go and evacuate the children and arrest the bandits uh, wherever they may be. But nobody appears to be thinking in this direction, and it is very, very sad. More importantly, the policy of reward of rehabilitating kidnappers and bandits and uh, empowering them and they pay huge sums of and huge ransom each time they have talked people also seems to be foiling this if we are going to be paying kidnappers and bandits in the northern part of the country what moral justification do we have as a nation to continue to prosecute Evans who is standing trial here in Lagos for kidnapping people for ransom. If what is good for good, not equally good for Ganga, the public should also have released Evan, uh, rehabilitate him, and ask him to go home and say no more. So these are very, very puzzling and troubling issues that we as a nation require to really address. We have no more justification whatsoever, like I said, to continue to try Evan to continue to try some of the boys in iPod and some other people who may have alleged who are standing trial for the kidnapping and banditry in the southern part of the country. We should have the core policy, the same measure for whoever may be engaged in this kind of heinous crime. All right. All right. Mr. Kolawale, I want us to take a look at the story that has made the headlines across the papers about grazing roots. And it says, autumn blows hot, plans to sue Buhari. Also, um, we see it on the, um, the Guardian newspaper, Falano as well as Ohanez and Digbo is kicking um, over this. Now, we know that this grazing roots um, discussion came up, you know, uh, quite a while ago. And um, despite the fact that the southern governors have said that they are against this and that starting September 1st, they will ban open grazing in their states. The president seemed to want to go ahead to revive grazing roots in the country. 
But now Autumn is taking this to court. So what do you um, foresee to be the outcome of this if this eventually goes to court? Yeah, thank you. This is a very, very interesting story. And your question is a very beautiful one. Let me say outside it that you and I will know that there is no love lost between Governor Autumn and the President Muhammad Buhari. When the killings in Benue State first started, you will recollect that the president said he was going to send the Secretary General of Police to Benue State to unravel what is happening there and bring the situation under control. But right under the president's note, the idea of police refused to go to Benue State to do anything. And the president didn't apply any sanction against the idea of police. For me, I smell a rat in there. It must be that uh, the president in the first instance never wanted the idea of police to go in there. It could also be that the president uh, was just uh, playing to the gallery. It could also be that somebody is enjoying what is happening to the people in the state, wanting to punish them for the insufficiency of their, of their governor, who has always insisted on the rights of his uh, people. As to what I'm going to court, I'm not too sure that much is going to come out of there. Why do I say this? I say this because we have the executive arm of government, the presidency, the attorney general of the federation, the Department of State Security Service, the Nigerian police, who have no respect whatsoever for the rule of law, and who have always flagrantly disobeyed court orders. So when you take them to court and know that, yeah, it is good to take them to court at least to be on record as civilized people. But rather than engage in the self help you as a governor, you as people of the state, you went to court to seek redress for your rights that are being violated. Such that when in future you have a responsible people in government, people have respect for the rule of law, people will obey court order, then you can always invoke whatever orders you get in court for compensation or at least to bring to book those who are flagrantly disobeyed court orders when something when one was done uh, with respect to this uh, great knowledge. As to the southern governors and what have you, well, they are just merely eating their heads against the wall. To the extent that even though they are described as the chief security officers of their state, do they really have the quasi power? Do they have the security forces, the police, the army, the navy and all that to defend and enforce whatever security they want to enforce in their respective states? The answer is no. No governor can give an order to a commission of police to carry out any security activity within the confine of his state, and then the commission of police will obey. Rather, the commission of police will first call up, which have called the IG of police uh, to uh, inform him and to ask for permission to carry out whatever order the governor may have given. And then the IG will call the president, who solely appoints the Inspector General of Police, even though that is not what the Constitution prescribes. It is the Police Service Commission and Council that should appoint, uh, that should certainly appoint the Inspector General of Police. So, All right. so they say that the governor don't have the quasi power to enforce the new, the grazing, the ban on open grazing that uh, law that they have um, all um, uh, enacted uh, makes the law just uh, uh, redundant and something that can only be enforced when in future the public will have the state police that they can send into the forest and all that to ensure that this new grazing, that this uh, ban on open grazing in southern parts of Nigeria uh, could be enforced. I'm not also sure that I'm taking that they do have or the Eastern Nigeria Security Network, or a group as uh, it is in the East, can enforce the no open grazing in the southern part of the country. The massive quasi power that is the hand of the federal government will be used uh, to frustrate and also to ensure that they don't enforce the open grazing rule. As to the presidency that is being insisting on open grazing, I will want to say that they are the worst enemies of the Fulani people, of the open grazing people that we do have in the country. When you have those so-called uh, open grazing routes uh, before independence and all that, 
The population of Nigeria wasn't this big. The desert has not encroached to most of the places it has encroached to today. And uh, furthermore, a scientific means of the animal husbandry hasn't developed to the level in which it has developed now. So if anybody loves the full animal, what sort, that kind of a person will be doing is to encourage them to engage or embark on ranch, ag ranch agriculture so that the animals can be better fed and produce more meat and more milk and more skins for production of shoes, belts and what have you. And also for the full animal children to be able to go to school and then uh, live a decent and normal life that the children of other tribes and uh, clans in Nigeria are, are living. More importantly, this directive of Mr. President of the Presidency is in sharp contradiction to what he had gone to Casino to do. The same president has received has about six billion naira to the government of Casino State to start developing land agriculture in Casino State. So if he has done that, why would the same government now be insisting on open grazing in some other parts of the country where you are already putting that money? to develop rank agriculture in Katsina State. Right. Like we used That's to say, Ole. what is good for the goose should equally be good for Canada. What the presidency should have done, if they love the full and person, and if they want peace throughout the length and breadth of Nigeria, is to equally make the same resources available to all the states of the tradition so that they can begin to develop rank agriculture. There is no future in open grazing, either for the full and or for the Nigerian nation. All right. Um, you can also quickly share your thoughts on the um, events in Wari over the weekend with the coronation of uh, the new Lu of Wari. Um, it was, of course, a, a weekend-long event. Hello, my brother. Louder, louder. Oh, I'm asking, you know, if you can also share your thoughts on the coronation of the Lu of Wari. It also makes the papers this morning. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, you know, I am not a fan of the monarchy. The reason why I'm not a fan of the monarchy is simply because I detest a situation in which somebody will just by an accident of birth become a leader and begin to preside uh, over their people. I would rather think that it is individuals' intellectual capacity, their contribution to the society, their understanding of the management practices uh, and culture that should determine who becomes a culture. But uh, since that institution, have not been scrapped. With, and then since um, they also draw their salaries and emoluments from the taxpayers' money, yeah, we continue to tolerate them as it were until probably the institution is scrapped. Because even in Britain, as we are today, where you have the Queen and all that, a lot of people are agitating that that institution should be scrapped, that it is a kind of parasite on the taxpayers. And they are, they are no longer relevant, they are no longer contributing anything to the society. Now that society is feeding a multiple institution that doesn't have any place in the democracy. Uh, for the young man, I congratulate the date of 37. He's become the only of worry. And the tone of the only of worry is a very, very important tone. It's, a, it's an old age um, uh, tone that uh, is a very, very uh, prestigious. The young man is well educated and all manners of stumbling block has been placed on his path before now, such that uh, he probably would have been the only of worry from six years ago. But certain people came up with a traditional policy that since his mother is not um, from Benin or from worry, the constitution of France has um, him becoming the only of worry. And because of that, his uncle, Emiko, was made the only of worry until the man uh, passed away recently due to COVID-19. The concern of Nigeria and France as a discrimination on the basis of birth, on the basis of religion, on the basis of ethnicity. So it is repugnant to natural justice to so say because a man's uh, mother is not from uh, Benin or from certain places, then he is not entitled to certain things. That is not the grain of our law. That is not the spirit and letters of a Nigerian concern. Now that the sanity has prevailed, I congratulate the law of worry. I wish him the best of luck uh, throughout his time of worship. I also want to remind him that uh, there has always been a bond between the Yoruba people and the Shekiri people because they are cousins. But the present of Lua Wari's father 
never understood that he severed all the relationship that used to exist between the Yoruba and the Shekiri for reasons best known to him. And I am saying that the relationship between the Yoruba and the Shekiri is a symbiotic relationship. They are both cousins, the Yoruba and the Shekiri people. And when you also look at the Shekiri people and the Yoruba people, so many Shekiri leaders, like Alfred Wale, and so many of them, have used their resources to promote Yoruba cause. Some of them, like Alfred Wale, also sacrificed his life to promote Yoruba cause. Alfred Rewani was key because of his struggle to get uh, the election of MK Abdullah as the president uh, uh, revalidated. Alfred Rewani throughout his life put his resources behind the Yoruba people, behind the chief of the whole of us to realize his political ambition. All right, Mr. So Kola Wale. And look forward to the new law of worry, strengthening the relationship between the Yoruba and the security people because the Shakiri people are an endangered species, very small tribe. When shops become pushing, they might need a larger tribe like the Yoruba to protect their interests. All right. Mr. Kolawale, let's um, finally take a look at the big story on the punch. And it's about the federal government versus the National Association of Resident Doctors. Now, we know that this matter, the federal government took it to the industrial court, but um, President Muhammadu Buhari actually ordered on Friday that, you know, negotiations should continue. And according to the story, um, more negotiations are supposed to continue today and that there should be another memorandum of understanding signed today. But NARD is saying that they're tired of signing MOUs, that they've signed MOUs, MOAs, you name it, and that what they need now is for the government to begin to pay, and they do, do, they do not want any more promise. But um, we see the minister here saying that um, they're not negotiating with NARD, that they're negotiating with the Nigerian Medical Association. So I don't know how you see this matter here, where the um, NMA, um, rather, the NARD is refusing to sign any more MOUs, saying that the federal government cannot be trusted, while Ingigi here is saying that all negotiations that they, that they would do would be with the NMA, and that the NMA can go ahead and dialogue with the NARD. What, what is happening in the health sector is a monumental tragedy. It is uh, not what should be happening in this era of a pandemic when people are dying like flies all over the place. Uh, what is really the difference between NARD and the NMA? Are they not the same branch of the same medical people? The NMA are just the resident doctors. Why the, the NARD are the resident doctors? Why is it? Why the medical doctors is just the umbrella body? So for me, I indicate to be saying that they didn't negotiate with NARD, but only the NMA. It doesn't make sense to me. The minister is just uh, playing on semantics, or is just uh, uh, being clever by half. The truth of the matter is that our health sector, like the educational sector, like the infrastructure sector, are not being properly funded. And we require to fund these places the way they should be funded. If we have done the needful, since the beginning, the medical tourism that we see Mr. President do periodically, that his son also embarked upon when he had an accident, and that the wife also does regularly and all that, wouldn't have been there. And you know, this government has been in power now for about six years, and uh, within the last six years, they have not been able to put in place a decent, a well equipped, and well served medical institution anywhere in the country. It wouldn't be too much by now if we have at least about six well equipped, well staffed, well trained, and uh, beautiful infrastructure uh, in uh, six geopolitical zones where people can go in there and receive treatment. But I think the government is not committed to that um, uh, project. My advice to the NARD and the NMB and all those who work in the medical sector will be like my advice to the I mean, to the university teachers, and look, let us, all of us concentrate on good governance. There is no aspect of our life that is properly funded. The NMA, the NLG, the ASU people cannot live as an, as an oasis uh, of comfort in a society in which there are people, in which every other sector is in a deplorable uh, condition. If we all team up together and fight for good governance, and we put good people in government and all that, there will be a better and more rational allocation of resources 
and all sectors of our life, whether it be education, whether it be the health sector, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be in, uh, even uh, security that we all have, will be properly funded. It is utopia for the doctors, whether they be NMA or NLC. It is utopia for the academic people to think that they can have well-funded uh, hospitals, well-funded universities, well-funded infrastructure, when there are no good people in, in, in government. It's impossible, it's utopia. So that is the direction with this society should be moving. And not for us to start creating a noises of influence, a noises of wealth, a noises of a better pay, or differential pay structure for certain persons. It doesn't work that way. We have tried it in the justice system in which judges and registrars are being paid specialized salaries. We thought we, if we pay them good salaries and not that, that will stop corruption. And then our hospitals, I mean our, our courts, will start running smoothly. There won't be too many backlogs, the backlog of cases. But as that happened, as it stopped corruption in the, in, the, in the justice system, as the courts working smoothly and efficiently the way they show up, is the diary of the Supreme Court, not freed up to the year 2023. So this is the reality. Let all professionals in this society come together and fight for good governance, especially now that 2023 is around the corner. And they should start living this life of utopia that will carry them nowhere. All right, Mr. Kolawole, uh, we will wrap up uh, the conversation here. Thank you very much for starting our Monday uh, with us. Thank and we you. We wish you a very interesting week ahead. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So it's a pleasure speaking with both of you. Thank you. All right. Stay with us. Uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going to be looking deeper in, at the Petroleum Industry Act and the controversy surrounding it. Uh, reactions from uh, the Niger Delta mostly. And uh, we'll be joined by two very, very interesting persons to share their thoughts on uh, the recent developments. Stay with us on The Breakfast.